We light this chalice with words from Blessed by Eric A. Heller Wagner. Blessed is the fire that burns deep in the soul. It is the flame of the human spirit touched into being by the mystery of life. It is the fire of reason, the fire of compassion, the fire of community, the fire of justice, the fire of faith. It is the fire of love burning deep in the human heart, the divine glow in every life. Good morning. Welcome to this digital service of First Unitarian Church here in Des Moines. My name is Birch Spick and I'm the celebrant for this morning's service. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. I'm glad you're joining us this morning. Whether you're here for the hour, for a lifetime, or somewhere in between, thank you for joining us in this community that grows ethically and spiritually, serves justly, and loves radically. Our pulpit guest today is Dr. Rebecca Gibson. 
Dr. Gibson is an independent scholar whose published work includes Desire in the Age of Robots and AI, an investigation in science fiction and fact, Palgrave Macmillan, 2019. The Corseted Skeleton, a Bioarchaeology of Binding, Palgrave Macmillan, 2020. And Gender, Supernatural Beings, and the Liminality of Death, Monstrous Males, Fatal Females, Lexington Books, 2021. She holds a PhD in anthropology from American University, and when not writing or teaching can be found reading mystery novels and it's a pile of stuffed animals. Please remember to keep your microphones muted during this service. After the service, everyone is welcome to turn your mics back on and join us in coffee hour in the breakout rooms. Our gathering song this morning is number six from our gray hymnal, I must answer yes to life as long as I have breath. The words will be on the screen, so please keep your mics muted and sing along at home as Barb Martin leads us in song. Special music this morning is by members of this congregation, Karen Kramer and Roseboom and Elaine Inlap. Hold on just a minute, Bert, you're jumping. Hello, my name is Rebecca Gibson, Dr. Rebecca Gibson. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm speaking to you today from the land that is the traditional territory of the indigenous Potawatomi people. Whenever you hear a land acknowledgement, please consider donating a dollar or more to support indigenous organizations or indigenous led grassroots change movements and campaigns. Please encourage others to do the same. Today I'll be talking about belief, love, self-love and identity formation through clothing and physical presentation. Our identities begin to be formed for us before we are born and continue with ideas about appropriate clothing, adornment, and behavior into our childhood years. However, as we grow and change those identities, which our friends, family, relations, and cohort form for us, may bear less and less resemblance to who we really are. Thankfully, the choice becomes ours, and with it, a new type of self-love. Back to you, Birch. Thank you, Rebecca. 
a special music is Music in My Mother's House by Stuart Stotts, performed by Karen Kramer and Roseboom and Elaine M. Lau. There were wind chimes in the window, bells inside the clock, an organ in the corner, tunes in the music box. We sang while we were cooking or working in the yard. We sang all the This week are provided with the usual normal seriousness because giving should never hurt. <laughs> A UU minister told their congregation, we don't often read from the Bible or talk about sin, but next week I plan to preach about the sin of lying. To help you understand my sermon, I'd like you all to read Mark 17 in the Christian Bible. So the following Sunday, as they prepared to deliver their sermon, the minister asked for a show of hands. They wanted to know how many had read Mark 17. Every hand in the room went up. The minister smiled and said, Mark only has 16 chapters. I'll now proceed with my sermon on the sin of lying. 
We don't often give homework here at First Unitarian, but I do encourage you to meditate on the wise words of Ecclesiastes 1019 for our offering here today. A feast is made for laughter, wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. This morning offering will now be given and received through the link in the chat. While we're outside of our physical church, instead of passing the offering basket, we encourage each of you to use the giving page on the church's website or mobile app. You'll find the link posted in the chat. Half of our offering goes to social justice programs of our congregation, and the other half goes to our faith in action partners for this year, who are Knock and Drop and Just Voices. In this congregation made distant by space, but connected by care for one another, we gather each Sunday to tend to one another's joys and concerns. When we are together in person, we lift up the names of those people we hold in our minds and our hearts, aloud or silently. If you are carrying someone in joy or concern this morning, you may share that in the chat box. Let our hearts also be with all those near and far, with the people the world over who are in need of care and who care for their communities. For people who work to meet the needs of their communities, for those continuing to speak out against injustice, for frontline workers in healthcare and service industries, for families and communities grieving the loss of loved ones. May we bear witness to atrocities that flash before our eyes. May we bear witness to the struggles to overcome which we have not yet seen. 
When we gather together in our congregation's building, it's our tradition to light three candles, one for the joys and concerns we've shared, one for the names we have raised up, and one for all that remains unspoken, but present here in our hearts. Outside of our building, gathered here together, we take a moment to honor these joys and concerns. For the first reading today, I have two short excerpts from the movie Cloud Atlas. Belief, like fear or love, is a force to be understood as we understand the theory of relativity and principles of uncertainty, phenomenon that determine the course of our lives. Yesterday, my life was headed in one direction. Today, it is headed in another. Yesterday, I believed that I would never have done what I did today. These forces that often remake time and space that can shape and alter who we imagine ourselves to be begin long before we are born and continue after we perish. Our lives and our choices like quantum trajectories are understood moment to moment. At each point of intersection, each encounter suggests a new potential direction spoken by the character Isaac Sachs, played by Tom Hanks in the movie Cloud Atlas. To be is to be perceived, and so to know thyself is only possible through the eyes of the other. The nature of our immortal lives is in the consequences of our words and deeds that go on apportioning themselves throughout all time. Our lives are not our own. From womb to tomb we are bound to others, past and present and by each crime and every kindness we birth our future. Spoken by the character Sanmi451, played by Bay Duna in the movie Cloud Atlas. This week's words for meditation are adapted from Drawn Together by Jennifer Grayson. We come together every week, bound not by creed or mutual desire to please one God or many gods. Yet we are drawn together by a belief that how we are in the world, who we are together, matters. We light our chalice each week together in the knowledge that love, not fear, can change this world. Holding these words and images in mind, please join me in a minute of silent thought, meditation, or prayer. Beginning and ending this time with the ringing of this bell.
The second reading for today is a few paragraphs from my friend and colleague, Dr. Augustine Fuentes' book, Why We Believe Evolution and the Human Way of Being. Belief is the most prominent, promising, and dangerous capacity that humanity has evolved. Belief is the ability to draw on our range of cognitive and social resources, our histories and experiences, and combine them with our imagination. It is the power to think beyond what is here and now and develop mental representations in order to see and feel and know something, an idea, a vision, a necessity, a possibility, a truth that is not immediately present to the senses, and then to invest wholly and authentically in that something so that it becomes one's reality. Beliefs and belief systems permeate human neurobiologies, bodies, and ecologies, acting as dynamic agents in evolutionary processes. The human capacity for belief, the specifics of belief, and our diverse belief systems structure and shape our daily lives, our societies, and the world around us. We are human, and therefore we believe. For many humans, there is nothing more powerful than the deep emotional and psychological state we call love. We believe in love, and it matters. But love means different things to different people. In the Western scholarly tradition, we tend to draw our ideas of love from ancient Greek and medieval Christian concepts. Many contemporary philosophers, psychologists, and neuroscientists identify love as a desire, an urge, or a neurochemical process. Other traditions from diverse societies present a range of ideologies connecting to love, attachment, caring, sexuality, and emotional investment. While a common definition remains elusive, there's no doubt that the suite of sensations and experiences that are collapsed into the term exist as a component of human bodies and lives. Despite not agreeing on exactly what love is or how to describe it, most humans certainly believe in it. The evidence for love's centrality in human landscapes of belief is in the trails and marks that love leaves in our psychology, neurobiology, physiology, behavior, writings, songs, histories, and myths. But this love refers not only to the contemporary notion of romantic love, which itself is a concept whose historical presence across human societies is much debated. Rather, it refers to the amazing human capacity to experience a particularly deep attachment and devotion to specific others. Human love can be romantic, familial, and chummy, and can even bridge species. In all cases, it involves a deep psychological, even physiological devotion. Most humans feel they've experienced some aspect of being in love and think of it as a transformative experience. But in reality, there is no single description, experience, or even a particular physiological or psychological process that we can pin down as the source or embodiment of love. Love is not an entity unto itself, but a suite of connections between human social and physiological processes intertwined with belief. Love draws on our cognitive and emotional capacities, our experiences and perceptions, and it has its roots embedded in our distinctive evolutionary histories. The capacity to experience love deploys belief in one of humanity's most powerful contexts, interpersonal relationships. Thank you. Our centering song today is number 148. Eight, let freedom span both east and west. You'll find the words on the screen. Please keep your mics muted. Oh, 
and east and west will meet and share, and souls shall build with borders. Today's sermon is titled, Exploring Belief in Our Own Identity as an Act of Self-Love. Whether we know it or not, our identity begins to be formed for us before we are born. When I say pink or blue, 10 to 1 you know I'm referring to baby colors, and those colors come with identities attached to them, pink for girls blue for boys. If you try to find baby clothes, baby toys, baby supplies in other colors, you might get a few things in pastel green or pastel yellow, purple less so, white because it stains so easily is often shunned. But these ostensibly neutral colors, green, yellow, purple, are few and far between when compared to the binary of pink and blue. The formation of identity begins as soon as the 14th week sonogram, when the doctor is able to visually confirm the sex of the baby, and even reactions against the artificial dichotomy of the binary, pink and blue, are set within a framework of that binary. The trend of having gender reveal parties, which should more realistically be called sex reveal parties, is embraced or rejected with our society's views on identity in mind, as people slice into cakes, release balloons, or set off occasionally dangerous explosive devices colored pink or blue. Pink or blue. Girl or boy. But it wasn't always like that. As a biological anthropologist, an archaeologist, an historian, and a gender studies scholar, I try to take the long view of human behaviors and their physical manifestations. Trends come and go, and in the 1800s and early 1900s, one could often find the colors reversed. Blue for girls, pink for boys. The meanings we give to these colors, the ways they are used to form our identities, are not static through time, yet their physical effects are real. By as early as kindergarten, girls and boys, or rather those children who are assigned female or assigned male at birth, are behaving in manifestly different ways, and while much of the impetus comes from their families, while at play in the classroom, the children themselves do the majority of identity reinforcement, with male identified children choosing or being strongly encouraged to choose more masculine toys and activities, and female identified children choosing or being strongly encouraged to choose more feminine toys and activities. Boys are meant to play with trucks and trains and soldiers and to run and play tag and wrestle boys will be boys. Girls are meant to play with kitchens and dolls and dresses and to play on the swings or the slide or to play pretend. Act like a lady. Multiple studies have shown that the ways we behave as children are firmly divided along gender lines and that deviation from these norms results in stigmatization, punishment, whether by school authorities or peers, and an internalized sense of self-doubt, isolation, and a lack of normalcy. And yet, what is normal? To quote the Batman villain Harley Quinn, normal's just a setting on a dryer. The biology that we are born with should not determine who we are nor limit our contributions to the world, but we treat it as though it does. Our sex is not our destiny and is only one part of our identity, only one part of our physical presentation, only one part of what distinguishes me from you, you from your parents, your parents from the stardust from which we all have formed. 
These ideas about normality stem from the conflation of sex and gender and the conflection, sorry, conflation of gender and behavioral traits. To begin with the first conflation, it's good to have some definitions. Our biological sex is the sum total of the factors which the medical community has determined apply to three categories of human physical differences, namely male, female, and intersex. These factors are genetics and primary and secondary sex characteristics. The chromosomes you carry within you, the shape of your skeleton, the way that hair grows on your body, the way that you mature at puberty, are all manifestations of your sex. But this has nothing to do with your gender. Gender is a massive spectrum of traits that society has coded as male, female, non-binary, bi-gender, agender, genderqueer, demigender, and many, many others. Gender is internal. It's a feeling. It's a deeply and personally held knowledge. It's a belief. So long as society contains this conflation of gender and sex, we will continue to assign identities to people based on their appearance, pink or blue, girl or boy. And that feeds into our second conflation, that of gender and specific behavioral traits. We all know the various terms thrown at children who are gender non-conforming. I shan't say them here, but we do all know them. We know what is said when a femme presenting child or a child assigned female at birth prefers to play roughly or to use their body in play or when they are aggressive or assertive. We all know what is said when a masculine presenting child or a child assigned male at birth paints their nails or wears a skirt or plays quietly and patiently or in ways that indicate caretaking. Our society sees an incongruity between their appearance and our assumptions about their sex and gender. And if there's one thing that humans overall do not like, it's incongruity. We love to put things in little boxes, which is natural. And this example of sex and gender is only one part of our identities and where we find those incongruities. There are myriad others. We want to understand the world around us. We seek to characterize, to dissect, to categorize, so that we can have knowledge of things. But that instinct is harmful if we fail to interrogate its origins in the creation and upholding of prejudicial and discriminatory systems. Socrates wrote that the unexamined life is not worth living. While our curiosity is not a uniquely human trait, our ability to create new things from our examinations and judgment from the world around us is. The way I could predict, predict your understanding of the terms pink or blue back at the beginning of the sermon is both a representation of how we fail to interrogate the systems in our lives and a very expedient jumping off point for that curiosity, for that examination of the lives we live, and for our chance to create something new, something different than the structures around us. Honest question. Do you even like pink or blue, whichever one you were assigned at birth? Chances are you outgrew it, your tastes changed, or you never liked it to begin with, or maybe you did, and you still do, and that's okay. But before I ask the question, had you thought about it? I mean, really thought about it, and had it been a conscious choice? We often like or claim to like the familiar and comfortable, or the familiar even past the time when it has ceased to be comfortable. We often would prefer to remain with what we know rather than re-examine our motives and make different choices. Again, very human instincts towards self-preservation. But what is the self we are preserving? Why must our self be preserved or seen as static? When I was a child, I leaned hard into pink and purple. Inasmuch as I ever participated in activities with other children, I was relatively girly, particularly in, in terms of color choices. My dad, 
an unusual man, whether for the 1980s or just in general, took an equal role in raising me, playing with me, doing activities with me. So I also got my fair share of boyish activities. I can cook decent food and change a tire. I took ballet for six years, and when I was 16, I was a competitive rifle shooter. I never did learn to keep my eye on the ball, but I love going to baseball games and watching the artistry of the sport. Even if my team loses, go Cubbies. But until I became an adult, I never for once thought about my childhood color preferences. Did I like pink and purple because they appealed to me? Or did I like them because when you're a child, you're told to be appreciative of what you're given, and also you're generally not allowed to purchase your own clothing? I would say that my initial contemplation and rejection of my days in pink was a quarter-life crisis, but that would be a misstatement. I am an introspective person in general, not af afraid to stare too long into the abyss. My abyss, it turns out, stares back at me in a repeating loop of the questions, who are you? What do you like? Why do you do the things you do? And how does that answer the first question? Like Alice replying to the caterpillar through a cloud of metaphorical hookah smoke, I hardly know because identity is fluid and flexible and we have more choices once we can ask these questions of ourselves though the choices might not provide explanation and the questions may remain unanswered. My closet nowadays is mostly red and black. I like to think of them as pink and purple's grown-up cousins. However, as I was taking a step toward interrogating my own ways of identity formation and presentation, I was also looking into our past at the formation and presentation of identities in the 1800s. My research concentrates on women who wore corsets and the effect it had on their skeletons. I use women in this case because the change from a gender dichotomy to a gender plurality is very recent and those in my study would indeed have referred to themselves exclusively as women. The corset was the standard undergarment for almost 400 years and was used to create the structure of a person's dress with a wider bust and hips and a narrower waist. It is a very controversial garment, both then and now, and at the time it was said to mold the wax of the woman into a more culturally pleasing shape. A woman's entire physical form was changed to create her social and cultural identity. Both pundits, usually male, and doctors, always male, had opinions on how and when and why a woman should wear a corset. If she did so to a moderate degree without tightening herself excessively, that was good. She was a good and civilized woman. If she tight-laced or used the corset for vanity, that was bad. But if her corset was too loose, if she did not wear one at all, that was also bad. She was said to be wanton and uncivilized. In much of the literature that has survived to the present, women's voices are muted or absent, or couched behind genre-driven pseudonyms for their forays into print. The only way a woman could be taken seriously in speaking about her own experience was to do so while revealing as little about herself as possible. So we get magazine items from a woman named Mignonette, which means little cute one, or from a lady, where the words are ostensibly written by women, but there's no name attached to them should there be a public outcry against their publication. There are photographs from the time too, but with photography being such a young science then, most of them are strictly and stiffly posed. We see corseted women standing, sitting, or strolling, but for with very limited sorry, but with very limited exceptions, we don't see them laughing, running, or working. Yet absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. 
just because we don't see these things does not mean they never happened. And in fact, when some type of normal behavior is missing in an historical record, there are several reasons for it to be missing other than it not having occurred. Generally, we're seeing either confirmation bias, seeing what we expected to see, survivorship bias, seeing whatever survived to be seen, or we're seeing the suppression of a narrative for the privileging of a different one. In the case of women's identities and how they thought of and used their corsets, it's the latter. And when this narrative, the narrative of people who use their corsets for their own reasons was suppressed, the women lost their identities and became historically misunderstood as a uniform group rather than individuals with individual wants and needs and ideas and preferences. In my work, I try to untangle those individual people. I do still make a few situational generalizations. For example, I did my research on a skeletal collection disinterred from a solidly middle-class parish cemetery. So I know they were all Christian, that they all lived in a closely delineated neighborhood, and that they all ate the same types of things, drank from the same wells, were exposed to the same diseases, and importantly, wore the same fashions. I know that the women in this group would have worn corsets from adolescence to death, and that their identities were partially formed by being part of the St. Bride's Parish in London. But although this is what I know about them in death, they were so much more than that in life. When the cemetery was excavated, the remaining tombstones were unable to be matched to the skeletal remains due to the reason for the excavation. The church was bombed during the Blitz in World War II. Therefore, when I evaluated the skeletons, what I knew about them was confined to the reasonable assumptions I made earlier regarding demographics and environment, and to the data curated by the osteologists who cleaned, catalogued, and stored the skeletons at the Museum of London's Center for Human Bioarchaeology. I could hold the skull of a woman who died at 80 years old, and I could tell you her height, the types of diseases that left marks on her skeleton, and that she had corseted, but I could not put a name to her nor tell you her date or cause of death. I could get pieces of her identity, but not all of it. So I turned to the archives and culled the data of 3,815 women who died between 1770 and 1850, the dates when St. Bride's was burying people in this portion of the cemetery. And I found some young women, some very old women, but mostly women between 45 and 70 who lived in the parish or who were inmates at the workhouse or prison. I found women who died of tuberculosis and cholera. I find, found women who died of childbed fever and of exhaustion. I found women who died of madness or a visitation of God. I found women whose grandchildren lived and died in the same parish. I found mentions of motherhood, of wifehood, of domesticity, of work and toil, but I found no mention of the corset. This garment, which according to popular discourse, formed their identity from the outside in, from the public to the private, was not a factor in the last recorded moment of their lives. And I realized suddenly how much emphasis we place on the external when we should be tending to the internal. While we each have things that we use externally to signify our identities, hair, clothing, adornments, behaviors, speech patterns, possessions, these things are not equivalent to our identities. They are there to be read by others, to be perceived and to be understood, to give a message about what we value about ourselves, and they are de facto limited by our circumstances. They're restricted to what we can afford, what is available around us, what we feel safe showing to the world, and by the expectations of the culture we exist within. 
Just as the women in St. Bride's Parish wore the corset because it is what civilized women do, so too do we wear certain things and behave certain ways because of the ideas we hold about civilized behavior. And so our identities, the internal feeling of ourselves, remain fragmented on the outside with no one but ourselves knowing the extent of them. But we do know them. We can know them. If we ask ourselves those earlier questions, who am I? What do I like? Why do I do the things I do? And how does that answer the first question? Knowing is the first step to believing. Knowing is the first step towards authentic self-love. And yes, knowing can be painful, difficult, traumatizing or re-traumatizing, and can involve a rejection of that which was given to us or forced onto us as a child. It's not all sunshine and kittens to have a discovery of self, but it is so important and so powerful that I believe wholeheartedly that it is worth doing. As mentioned in the reading from Dr. Augustine Fuentes, love is an extension of the human capacity for belief. Dr. Fuentes places love interpersonally, but I think that an important aspect of love is the love of self. To love, we must believe. To believe, we must understand. To understand, we must unashamedly and unflinchingly look within and acknowledge our uniqueness, our wholeness, our worthiness, inclusive of our flaws, without self-aggrandizement, without self-loathing or doubt, and with clarity and respect. Whomever you are, a lifetime of actions and reactions, cultural influences and individual choices got you to now. Every second we are here on this earth is a chance to decide the answer to the question, who am I? And to answer it with a clear and aspirational idea of who we want to be. We do not have to settle for pink or blue. We can choose any color of the rainbow and others of more sublime nuance. While I am partnered, I live alone by choice. I cook and clean for myself and myself alone. I decorate and choose entertainment for myself and myself alone. I spend most of my time with only myself as company, and yet I am not lonely, for I am there. A few good friends of mine have expressed surprise at the fact that I regularly prepare ornate meals or design fancy cocktails or buy myself flowers. There's no one to enjoy them with me, they say, and it's extraordinary that I make this type of effort for myself. But I? I am astonished that they do not. This treatment of myself goes beyond the current trend of self-care. It's not an indulgence. It's not bribing myself for hard work or giving myself rewards for good behavior. It is simply the acknowledgement of myself as a whole person, as an identity which results in the desire to live and com in comfort and happiness and wholeness and love because I am worth it simply for existing as myself. And no, my efforts are not always successful. I'm only human. But this realization about the necessity of self-love and belief in my identity and my ability to remake myself regardless of past missteps and failures makes me eager to get up and try again. Over and over and over, as long as I live, I will strive to do better, make myself happier, respect myself and my identity more. We hear about the golden rule, but we fail to turn it in your, inward. Yes, treat others how you would like to be treated, but also look within yourself. Find those aspects of your identity that were not socially conditioned. Find who you really are and what you really want and how you really need to be loved. And in so doing, treat yourself as well as you would treat others. Live authentically in self-love and in respect of your own individual identity, as only you can. I will now turn the service back over to Birch. Thank you all very much for inviting me to be with you today. Thank you so much for your words. We extinguish our chalice with words from be true, be well, be loving.
by Cynthia Landrum. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, our care for each other, our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith continues until we are together again, be strong through 